Okay, hello. It is wonderful to be here. I'm coming from New York where it's very cold right now, so any excuse to come to sunny LA, I will take. Um, my name is Deepa Subramaniam, and I wanted to thank all of you for coming here today. I couldn't be more excited to share some of the insights that I've gained over the last 15 years leading a variety of product design and engineering teams. Um, I actually worked at Adobe, so I, a lot of the insights I'm gonna share started taking root during my time at Adobe, um, and also at a smaller startup like Kickstarter, nonprofits like Charity Water, and now at the ACLU where I am. So these insights really came from all of those fast-paced organizations, um, including some time I spent running product uh, at Hillary Clinton's uh, 2016 presidential election. So this talk really originated from all of those real world experiences. And my hope is that at the end of this hour that we have together, it provides all of you some actionable insights that you can take back into your own organizations. So let me first share a little bit about me. I actually hail from California, the Bay Area. Um, I went to Berkeley, go Bears. Um, and I started my career as an engineer um, at Macromedia. And then Macromedia was acquired by Adobe. If there are some people here who might remember that history. Um, and while at Adobe, I was an engineer, and then I transitioned into being a technical product manager. Um, and so it's funny, I think this is actually the 10th Max I've spoken at. So uh, I have a long and fun history of coming here. So after 10 years at Adobe, um, I worked on a variety of different products, including the first few incarnations of Creative Cloud. Um, I wrapped up after 10 years, which is like ancient times in uh, tech Silicon Valley world. Um, but I ended up leaving Adobe to move to New York where I led product at a clean water nonprofit called Charity Water. Sort of this disruptive nonprofit, it almost feels like a startup and we raise money to uh, bring clean water uh, to the developing world. Um, and it was during my time at Charity Water, about two years in, that I got um, a call to come join Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign in 2016 as one of her product leaders. And so here is actually the tech team um, at Hillary for America. I joined when the team was, I think, less than 10 people shortly after she announced. Um, and here we are, I think this is just like three days before election night 2016. And this is really some of the best product managers, designers, engineers, user researchers that you could ever work with. And leading product on this team was amazing. I led product strategy for online fundraising, her website, um, policy technology, and our rapid response efforts. And it was my time at HFA where I truly fell back in love with building digital products. It was clear to me um, there just how all you really need is a few smart people empowered to really understand a problem area and come together um, with clear guidelines, clear goals, magic can really happen. So regardless of your politics or what you felt about the 2016 presidential race and everything that has happened since, um, I talk about that campaign because a lot of the lessons that we're gonna talk about today really came from that experience. The, they were lessons that were like planted in my brain during the campaign. Um, because a presidential campaign is really the ultimate startup. In basically 20 months, you are tasked with raising and spending a billion dollars, um, which I guess kind of makes it a unicorn, um, that Eileen Lee terminology for unicorn startup. Um, and the pace and the expectations and the work that you're doing can break even the strongest, uh, most resilient type of person. Yet, we didn't break. This picture is you know, a few days before the election, many of us have been working for 19, 20 months straight on this. Um, and yet, you know, we're not really white clawing life in this picture. You know, we're still pretty happy, we're aligned, we're focused, we are still shipping products leading up to, to the last night of the election. And so how did that happen? You know, how did we stay an aligned and focused team? Uh, those are some of the insights that I wanna share during this talk. So after the campaign, I joined Kickstarter to run product and design there. And in time, um, actually earlier this year, I uh, joined as the uh, first ever and new chief product and digital officer at the ACLU. So the lessons I learned at Charity Water, especially the campaign, helped me go into both Kickstarter and the ACLU to make real big structural changes. I was tasked with revitalizing product organizations that had, you know, for lack of a better term, kind of stagnated a bit. You know, there were, had been some missteps in product strategy, uh, there were some morale issues, there was some attrition. And so, even though we had really incredibly talented people, it always just felt like it was one step forward and two steps back. 
And so when I was asked to come in, the board at Kickstarter, the executive team at the ACLU, I was tasked with sort of writing that ship. And that always starts with um, looking at the team and putting in place some better practices. So that's what we're gonna cover today. So positive team health, high velocity shipping, and strategic execution. We all want this, you know, whether you're working at a product-driven organization or even you know, a firm, a creative agency, maybe you're a freelancer or a contractor. Whatever it is, we all show up at work every day. This is probably the foundation underlying our day-to-day -day work goals, correct? Aiming for a very healthy team dynamic and shipping or delivering or building quality stuff efficiently and strategically. Yet, we often get in our own way, right? Sometimes there's ill-defined roles and responsibilities. Sometimes there's toxic communication patterns. Sometimes there's very well-meaning but under-equipped leaders and managers. This is very, very common. Um, there isn't any organization out there that has never hit a speed bump, that has never developed you know, a frustrating feedback loop, or has had everything figured out from inception to, to this current moment in time. So, you know, I know there's a lot of diverse backgrounds in this room, but the common thread that I'm gonna guess kind of ties this all together in this session is that you're here likely because you occupy one of these roles listed in this slide. It might be the case that you're all operating in different environments, but regardless of that, whether it's the teams that you lead um, or maybe co-lead, the teams that you work with, um, your clients, things like that, the goal in today's talk is to provide tips that are applicable to everyone in this room. So I like to cut to the chase. So here are the seven tactics that we're gonna uh, talk about today um, and how they can drastically improve the health of your teams. We'll talk about how clearly defined roles and responsibilities absolutely improve velocity and accountability. We'll cover how it's essential for organizational buy-in and commitment to have living documents that cover your strategy and your process. Again, this is a tip that is valuable even if you don't work in a product-driven organization. We'll walk through how to navigate very common, very frequent, but also very difficult conversations in a mindful way. We'll discuss the power of cross-functional and problem-focused teams. And we'll wrap up by talking about, you know, sort of joining forces with your peer leaders um, and how necessary it is to sort of work with them, but also to work with them to let go when things need to be let go. So my goal is to provide tips and practices that are relevant to any type of organization. Many of my examples will come from sort of the product-driven world because that is my background, that is most of my day-to-day -day experiences, but they should be pretty easy to extrapolate into any organization and I'll try to like um, uh, make that clear as I, as I go through. Okay, so let's start with the first tactic that we talked about, which is around how valuable it can be to clarify functional roles and the individual and the shared responsibilities for those roles. So I'm almost positive there's no one in this room that has not seen um, the situation that happens when you have unclear roles and responsibilities. Whenever there's a lack of clarity around what I'm supposed to do, what my peer is supposed to do, and how our work comes together, you're in a place of really constricted collaboration, and that can waste time, waste money, and really be a morale killer. So how do you know that you're in this place of sort of constricted collaboration? You know, you might hear your team members say things like, well, that's not my job. And so that indicates that there is some strong belief of what one person thinks their job is, but maybe that's out of whack with the rest of the team's expectation. You might hear something like, okay, I already did that. Um, and that comes up whenever there's duplicative work or maybe the left hand's not talking to the right hand. And the worst, um, at least for me, what, what I find the worst, is when there are indicators that, was, that what was supposed to happen didn't actually happen. And then you might hear th things like, wait, who is supposed to do that? So these are all leading indicators of lack of role clarity. And on a team without role clarity, it may seem like nothing is happening with any sort of urgency. I call that inertia. Or maybe too much is happening with too little impact. That is basically controlled chaos. Or the worst symptom, in my opinion, is when folks are checked out because no one feels empowered to actually do anything. And that's basically ambivalence. 
And none of us should be feeling ambivalent in the precious time that we put towards our professional endeavors. Life's too short for that. So let's talk a little bit more about what kind of clarity is needed and solutions for how you as leaders can take your teams to help establish clarity within them, both within the teams and as they work with other teams. So what can we do about this? Well, first, we kind of have to understand the work that happens on a team. So I'm gonna take us through an example of what's very common in my world in the product development process, and a little bit about the numerous people involved in each phase. And then we'll come back to a solution that can really help uh, create role clarity on your teams. So if you, any of you here are designers or engineers or product managers or researchers working in a product development organization, you'll recognize this little dance of product development where on a product team, everyone has a unique part to play. And so these boxes kind of represent some of the common phases that you go through during product development. Regardless of how you chunk it up, generally the act of ideating and building technology involves a few common phases like the discovery phase where you're defining the problem and your plan of attack, you're quantifying the opportunity, um, and then you sort of move into the design phase where you're kind of like ideating on what the right solution is for that problem that you just defined in the discovery phase. You might move into the development phase at that point where you're preparing to build and release into the prime time uh, the solution that was identified. You got to do some testing and some uh, deployment to get it out into the world. And finally, seeing how your product performs in the, in the wild, understanding usage and deciding what to do next is a phase that I called post-deployment post iteration, which is sadly a phase that is often forgotten about, but it's a very important phase. So rinse and repeat, this is the, the magic of product development. And if you work at an agency or maybe you're a freelancer, your workflow might be different and not exactly mapped to this, but for the purposes of what we're gonna talk about, basically start thinking about the phases of your workflows and um, who is involved at each of those fa phases. So regardless of the type of workflow that drives your day-to-day -day work at your organization, there are several things that can make this complicated. So let's talk th through three complications that quickly come to mind. The first complication is that these phases never operate in a perfect sequence like this, right? In fact, they shouldn't. Phases overlap, there may not be enough time or resources to complete one phase and move into the other. They're sort of happening in parallel. There might be an escalation from the field that draws the attention away of the core team and then they have to go back to it. So there's sort of like a pausing and a restarting and a pausing and a restarting. So basically, you know, teamwork in this sort of neat workflow is kind of the wild, wild west. It's a mixture of both the proactive and the reactive. So to believe that each phase nicely slots into the next one is, is pretty folly. The next complication is that there's never just one functional role on a team that's owning each phase at a time. You might wanna think that's the case, but in reality, that's never how it actually works. Another way of phrasing this is that there, this is not you know, a baton race with a clear passing of the baton from person to person. It is very collaborative and everyone is sort of involved in, in all the different phases. So the idea that a PM wholly owns discovery or that the designer whole, wholly owns design or the engineer wholly owns the development phase is just not how it actually happens or how it should happen, right? Teammates have to work together on all these phases. And though some functional roles might take more of a lead during a particular phase, to get the whole thing done soup to nuts, it requires partnership and pairing. That's very integral. The third complication is what about all the other roles that exist within the organization, just beyond the product team? You know, Many organizations have a strategist or a data scientist, or even distinctions between functional roles. You know, There might be an engineering lead, an engineering manager, um, so on and so forth. So there are distinct and numerous roles within a product organization. This is very commonplace. And clarifying the specific and shared responsibilities across these roles is a necessity. Otherwise, people's toes are gonna get stepped on, they're gonna get frustrated. And that's gonna cause slowdown in execution, lower velocity, frustration, so on and so forth. So how can we clarify this? How can we create a clearer, more bought-in understanding of individual and shared roles and responsibilities on a team, regardless of the team that you're on. A tactic that I found very helpful is the power of a Venn diagram. Let's go back to you know, our middle school geometry. So this is a framework for functional teams to list out their unique and shared responsibilities as roles that intersect and overlap in the day-to-day -day work. And you can really do this with any type of role. It doesn't just have to be between an engineer, a designer, and a product manager. 
though that is the example we'll look at, but then we'll look at how to broaden that. So here's an example of a Venn diagram that I created to help clarify responsibilities between three common roles on product teams that I have led. And I forced my teams to go through this exercise because I was feeling some of that, mm, I don't know, weird juju in the air that comes out when they didn't have uh, clarity of their roles and responsibilities. So, you know, we had a product manager, a tech lead, and an eng manager. And again, this is a concept that is very specific to product development workflow, but it is applicable to all sorts of teams with different roles. It is very intentional that there's overlap between those circles. So what I did with my teams was I, I, I forced us all to sit down and think about what responsibilities go into those overlapping bits and what responsibilities live in those distinct bits. It's important to nail that down so that you can have an honest conversation and gain a shared understanding. This exercise is not useful and you will not get the desired end result if you as the leader create this and hand it to your teams. It's all about bringing them together into a conversation to almost co-author this together. And you'd be really surprised about what comes out, where there are different expectations, where we're all on the same page. You know, one time I've done this with my team <clears throat> at Kickstarter, and it was a multi-week process to get to a place where we sort of ratified this document together. I've worked at other organizations where it was like a one-hour meeting, one and done, and we were like, great, we're all on the same page. But that is still an important thing to do, and it's an important thing to revisit. In this example, we sort of went in and filled what the responsibilities of each role on the team has, and we began to sketch out what existed in the overlap. So here, the tech lead and the product manager um, you know, sort of worked together to scope and estimate the project work, documenting this Venn diagram and adding it you know, into some place where it can live on and be referenced. So we add it to your wiki, pin it to your Slack. It can really help in the future when there's conflict or confusion about who should be doing what. Because you can update it as things change, you can update it as you hire in new people and as your organizational structure changes, and you definitely should refer back to it regularly. So you can really take it further. Sometimes being super prescriptive is beneficial. I've actually gone through the detailed exercise of listing out all of the 16 permutations of intersections across a four-way Venn diagram, like the one that you see up there. And so regardless of the team structure at play, using Venn diagrams to list out roles and responsibilities, both within individual roles, <clears throat> and especially in those interesting intersection areas, is invaluable. It is definitely time well worth spent. It might seem like overkill, but believe me, it absolutely helps. It sort of is, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. Everyone gets on the same page, and now we can have a much more honest and candid conversation about expectations. This helps your super high performers. This helps the people who maybe aren't performing so well. It's very valuable. 80% of the time, there is agreement on what each of these roles is, is sort of expected to bring to the table and how people are supposed to partner to make it happen because partnership sort of seeds everything here. So building out a diagram like this with your team is super helpful, um, both those 80% of the time when you agree, but definitely that 20% of the time when stuff isn't happening, either because someone doesn't know it's their responsibility or maybe no one wants to do it. So have that explicit conversation. Define roles ratified across teams produce better accountability and higher velocity. I absolutely believe in that statement and that I definitely saw that once I walked my teams through this exercise to do that. My product teams knew how to operate, what was expected of each member, and the little pockets of overlap is where kind of that magic happened and we started seeing real innovation and empowerment. So let's move on to the next tip, which is really another tactic for revitalizing a team and it's the value add of creating living product documents and processes. So what exactly do I mean by this, especially that word living? I mean the product processes, the written documents that help keep your team's workflow on the right track forward, right? By living, I'm trying to call attention to the fact that these processes need to be tended to and updated regularly, almost like a plant that you have to kind of treat and grow and fertilize and water and pay attention to especially as your organization has those key inflection points that can really change things and cause the unknown to creep in. Maybe you're you know, doubling in size, you have a reorg, you're sort of incepting a new team within the organization, you get acquired, I don't know. But these, by having living product documents um, and processes, you can help your organization kind of navigate those inflection points better. 
So documenting processes is valuable on many fronts. First, the act of documenting means that you're having all of the necessary debates and conversations that really have to happen to gain enough buy-in to standardize your work processes. By doing this, you avoid reinventing the wheel. You avoid duplicating efforts and you avoid having sort of unnecessary disagreements. I can't tell you how often I see team members sort of change feature teams or sub teams within a broader organization and because processes are not documented and standardized, they have to relearn things, and that's a complete waste of time, both for the company and for the person involved. Similarly, when documents like specifications or research are not written down and easily accessible, people argue from the gut, and in some cases represent invalid or wholly incorrect facts that can kind of take root in an organization and just turn into law without any supporting evidence. And this can really waste time and energy and cause a lot of extra effort to kind of disentangle any disagreement. So to avoid that, I think personally, it's critically necessary to determine the key documents, meetings and milestones that will keep everyone aligned and moving forward on any team that you work on. This is important work to do. It is especially important for leaders to be involved in doing this. And I think it's fair to say that if this isn't happening, onus, you know, that, that, sh that should be, um, I don't know, a bad mark for leadership. This is really an important thing to do. So you all own your team workflow. And so to establish a process that helps you and your teams achieve your goals and establish good habits conducive to your company culture, you need to have documents, meetings, and milestones sort of documented. In fact, you can use this process to negate the bad things that might exist within your company culture. For example, maybe there's not really a tendency to write things down. Well, then standardized on a few required documents and you can start building that muscle memory to have a paper trail for decisions that are made. Or perhaps you know, your teams don't iterate enough um, on their products and so you're shipping a lot of 1.0s 1 1 and they're living out in the world, uh, you're never going back and revisiting them, okay? I call that MVP-itis and we've all done it. So what you might wanna do is standardize into your product development workflow an explicit phase that is dedicated to seeing how something you shipped has performed and explicitly deciding what to do next. So like I said, you can use this process of defining the key documents uh, meetings and milestones that you want to use in your team's workflow to augment or eradicate any of the bad things um, that exist within sort of uh, the company culture, bad habits you want to get rid of, or good habits that you want to keep supporting and, and fostering. So let me give a quick example of what I'm talking about here. So we talked about the discovery phase, right, and product development. Um, and actually, honestly, in most creative projects, you sort of have that discovery phase where everyone's kind of coming to the table to kind of understand, okay, what are we trying to do here? What are the goals? What, um, what do we know? What do we not know? What does success look like? You're gonna define sort of the problem, right? So in order to keep my teams focused and disciplined on leveraging this phase as much as possible and setting up all the rest of the phases as best as possible by having a successful discovery phase, I worked with them to identify and document our process. And that means identifying the key documents, meetings, and milestones that were explicitly part of each phase in the product development workflow. So here in the discovery phase, I asked that we always have um, a narrative document. Think of it as like a spec or a one pager kind of um, encapsulating what, what we're trying to do, what success looks like, so on and so forth. This wasn't optional, this was a required document and no project could kind of move or accelerate through this workflow without having some version of this document. And I don't mean a 20 page PRD, this can be as simple as like a one pager, but the act of doing that is transformative. It allows people to plug into the process, read a document and sort of understand, okay, what are we trying to do? What are we not trying to do? Um, and nix any like running around um, discussions that are a waste of time, so on and so forth. I also required that we have a feature kickoff meeting. Again, not optional. Every project, whether big or small, had to have this meeting where everyone kind of came together. Anyone who was involved in the project or even peripherally interested in the project, they had one moment before everything really took off to come together and to talk about what are we trying to do, what does success look like, share their opinions, so on and so forth. 
And as for milestones, well, I you know, made sure that every phase had a few key milestones. In this one, the discovery complete phase meant, okay, we have written a spec, we have had a kickoff, we have reviewed this with leadership, we're all on the same page, cool, this phase is done. This ship is moving forward, no backseas, okay? We're moving into the design phase. And so by having that explicit milestone, we could kind of understand that that was happening and no well-meaning, um, person could kind of jump in into a later phase and be like, well, I want to add these three requirements and change the success metrics to X, Y, Z. It was like, whoa, we decided that. You kind of missed it out. We'll think about it in a subsequent uh, version of the release, but we're moving forward. So similarly, say in that last phase that I really think is often missing in many product-oriented organizations, where you're kind of looking at what you shipped and deciding impact, that's that post-deployment and iteration phase. These are some of the documents in the meetings that I require. I definitely think once something has shipped, the product manager, the designer, the researcher, the tech team, lead, whomever, someone has to sit down in almost the same discipline we applied to writing um, a narrative doc in the beginning of this phase. We need to sit down and write out, okay, how is this thing performing? What's the quantitative and qualitative um, data that we have about usage and impact and our customers liking it and using it and so on and so forth. So I require a post-ship feature update document. And then I require us to get together in a room with leadership and stakeholders and partner teams and whomever to talk about it in a post-ship sync meeting. So again, your organization likely doesn't have or may not have a product development workflow as explicit as this, or maybe you're not even working at a startup and you're working at a creative agency where your project might go more like you know, pitching customers, moving into an ideation phase, building out, so on and so forth. Whatever workflow you have, the point I'm trying to make is that there can and should be documents, meetings, and milestones that can anchor that workflow and allow everyone to get on the same page. It might sound like a heavy lift in the beginning, but it will actually save time uh, over the course and the bigger picture because people aren't uh, missing out on things and, and um, having unnecessary conversations and meetings that can actually get eliminated by following this. So, if you're, so I encourage all of you to go back to your teams and especially uh, to your peer leaders and, and the people higher up than you, your leadership team in general, and reevaluate your own day-to-day -day workflows whether it's product development or one more specific to the organization that you're a part of, reevaluate the living processes, uh, specifically with an eye towards documents, meetings, and milestones that will make the flow better, allow more buy-in, allow more collaboration, allow more healthy conversation that will improve the velocity and the coordination on your teams. So remember to use that process to your benefit. It doesn't have to be heavy handed. I'm not saying go home and start a whole new process audit that takes you know, an entire quarter to finish. It can be very simple. You can start somewhere. Identify maybe a few missing meetings or documents that you wanna start uh, rooting into a requirement um, and have it be complementary to your culture. You know, um, And maybe use this kind of insight, use this tactic to generate a culture change within the organization. Um, and, 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 and see if you can sort of use this to kind of move things into a better place. Basically, you own your product process, you own your workflow, so use it to your benefit. Okay, let's switch gears a bit and talk a little bit more about uh, difficult conversations, which regardless of the type of organization that you work at, you probably have to have. You know, I know we've all had to have these. There are moments in all of our careers where we um, have to have really difficult conversations, and it is human nature. Uh, I definitely have been susceptible to this where I kind of avoid it because I know, oh gosh, I have to have this conversation. It's gonna be really tough, and I sort of shy away from that. It's very hard, um, but honestly, 99% of the time, it's very necessary to have those difficult conversations, to unblock your team, to unblock um, your partnership with a colleague, uh, so on and so forth. So you know, why is this so hard? Well, it's not just a, a personality thing or a matter of opinion, it actually goes back to silent, science. So this is the amygdala, and the amygdala's job is to constant be, constantly be looking out for data in our environment and categorize it basically as a threat or as a reward. We all have this in our brain. That's it, that's the amygdala's job. Categorize something as a threat or a reward. Its job or purpose is not to be rational or logical, 
Really, the amygdala's job is to tell the rational and logical part of our own brains to go to sleep when a threat is seen. So a bear is headed our way, great, okay. Go to sleep and just run because that's the type of behavior that has helped us survive for millennia. And so it's the amygdala that tells us to react fast enough to duck, to run, to avoid danger. And so the amygdala is responsible for all of those surprising human emotions that can come up whenever you have to have difficult conversations whether in your personal life or in your professional life with teammates, this thing is at play. So the amygdala is freaked out by a lot more than just bears. You know, the amygdala can feel very threatened by receiving feedback, causing someone else to freak out, which is what happens when you share feedback with someone else. Um, when it feels, you feel like you're sort of kicked out of the cool kids group or excluded from a conversation, maybe there was a meeting you weren't invited to, an email that you were left off of that you felt, hey, I'm a part of this project, I should be involved in there. Well, your amygdala is not gonna like that and it's gonna freak out. Um, when someone thinks that you're wrong, these are the things that can kind of like trigger the amygdala um, to kick into high gear or you know, some of the terminology out there is the amygdala can get hijacked in these scenarios. And so sadly, these are all the scenarios that come into play when you have to have difficult conversations at work with your team, with your colleagues, with your peers. So if this is what the amygdala is threatened by, well, the amygdala loves this list of things, right? It helps the amygdala to chill out when um, you are feeling like you're belonging to a group or when you're making progress towards a goal, when you are given a sense of choice and autonomy, um, when you have an experience that feels fair and equitable. Um, and predictable. Those are the things that really can cause the amygdala to calm down. So we can use that list to our benefit when having difficult conversations with our teams um, and, and successfully have those conversations, but try and avoid some of that freak out. So the typical workplace doesn't really have a model for having those hard conversations, especially in a way that doesn't cause our amygdalas to freak out. So it's really hard how to know how to get started. You know, this is very valuable information, but how do you practically apply it? Um, so some tips for creating an environment for fostering better conversations include things like ground rules for meetings. You know, even if they're not meetings where things could get dicey or emotional, ground rules are, are really valuable. So re research shows that um, all human groups use rules of engagement to make something that can be very unpredictable uh, things like you know, human conversation be a little bit more predictable. And so we know our brains love predictability. It causes the amygdala to calm down. So most of the ground rules that we have in everyday life are pretty implicit, right? You know, don't interrupt each other, things like that. So ground rules don't have to be um, stuffy and stiff. Um, I don't think, I don't really like them when they're cutesy and gimmicky too, like they don't have to spell an acronym or something like that. They just have to be sort of short so that our brains can remember it and use them and enforce them in your meetings because it can cause things to sort of move from that amygdala hijack place into that amygdala um, calming place. So keep them short, something our brains can remember. Here are my favorite ground rules for any meeting I'm running, honestly. It doesn't just have to be the big meetings where complicated strategic updates or reorgs are being shared. Any team meeting, honestly, even one-on-ones can benefit from a few of these ground rules. Hey, let's recognize that we need to stay curious and everyone's smart and trying. Let's give respect to the people who are speaking. No open phones and laptops and, and of course, uh, Vegas rules, you know. I wanna be able to trust that what we're talking about in this room stays in this room, which allows us to have a much more open and, and honest uh, and true conversation. So another common thing I see in organizations is that people are reluctant to talk to their leaders about their dilemma. Often, really strong, emerging leaders don't want to appear as if they are maybe ratting someone out or coloring someone else's opinion of someone on the team. So they avoid talking about what, is go what they're going through um, for fear that it might threaten the sense of belonging to that group. So, you know, when I first had to um, eliminate someone at my job, I met routinely with a small group of other managers to get some training and support on this because it was a very daunting thing as a first-time manager to have to fire someone. And I was really reluctant to tell that group about what I was going through, but I also really needed to get some support to help, uh, you know, figure out how to do this. I actually wasn't really getting that support from my manager at the time. So I didn't know what I was doing, and I felt really lost and reluctant to, to reach out to peers who I knew had sort of gone through that. 
Anyways, I got over my fear and I ended up sharing my dilemma with that group and they really leapt to support me. And so the most helpful thing that they did was they helped me sort of role play the conversation I was gonna have with this person as they helped them understand that we were letting them go. So that's another tip that I wanted to share, which is around role playing difficult conversations. It gives the person who needs to lead the conversation a safe place to practice the words they're gonna say and see how it feels to them. That sense of certainty is really empowering and again, pushes us into a place where we're not avoiding difficult conversations, but embracing them. So by the time you really get into the room to have that conversation, it's much less scary because you've had some practice and maybe you've been able to think through the possible reactions that might occur and be a little bit more prepared for that. The other part about role playing that's really great is it also opens your mind up to the different ways that people can approach the conversation. You know, you might think, okay, I'm going to have to have this difficult conversation with this person, and give them this really critical feedback, and they're gonna freak out. But if you role play with different types of people, you might see that there are a variety of different ways that people will um, uh, absorb that information and thus react. It helps you prepare better. So really, you know, one of my favorite things to do is to actually create an environment where role-playing difficult conversations is actually quite easy to do, especially as I moved higher into my career and I was now not managing direct reports but managing layers of leaders who themselves had to then have those difficult conversations. A lot of um, time and energy went into creating spaces in our team meetings and our leadership retreats and our strategic offsites where we kind of could create a space to talk through difficult conversations that would have to happen as we optimized the team or implemented a strategy change. And I created a space where we could then sort of role play those conversations. Still having your leaders, your leaders, peer leaders and those leading below you um, handle those difficult conversations themselves that may not solve all your problems, right? You might need to find someone internal who can act as a facilitator of these conversations. <clears throat> the key thing there is to find someone who doesn't have a stake in the outcome. You know, it probably won't be someone in HR because they might introduce a power dynamic that is less than helpful. Um, so some things that you can do is you might be able to bring in um, a facilitator who can help in resolving any sort of conflict that might arise. You might want to get trained yourself. There's a lot of resources out in the world. Um, and so basically, really think through who's going to help uh, mediate a particular conflict when those difficult conversations kind of blow into that um, uh, type of uh, scenario. Okay, next tactic. Again, a tactic I learned that has helped uh, me and my teams really navigate a lot of different change um, and, and stay sort of revitalized as the organization or the company or the campaign went through all these different phases. So as leaders, we really, really, really need to be comfortable letting go. And that can be easier said than done when money and people and critical things like that are on the line. Um, I learned this lesson the best and the hardest um, on the Hillary campaign. And so that's the example that I'll use. And so first, what's important to understand about um, a campaign, if you ever have the chance to work on, a, um, on any sort of campaign, presidential or otherwise, uh, it's, it's quite enjoyable. Um, it is really amazing to um, work and really understand from the inside out how, how these types of things work in the organization. So on the Hillary campaign, uh, really any presidential campaign has um, one job to elect a candidate. And to do that, there's sort of three kind of tactics that you're um, pursuing. And we call them the three M's, right? You gotta raise money, you gotta get your candidate's message out there, and you have to mobilize voters to go to the polls and vote for your candidate. So the tech team that I was a part of and helped lead product strategy on, um, we were in pursuit of those goals. So we were really a team within the organization that looked and acted and felt a lot like a startup that was helping the rest of the organization raise money, get our message out there, and mobilize voters. And so to understand why being willing to let go is so important, we have to understand a little bit about the pace of how a campaign works. And I know I'm giving a very you know, specific example. I don't know how many of you are working on presidential campaigns, but this concept does lend itself quite nicely to any organization that has to work fast, hit hard deadlines, and do it in an efficient way. So like I said, the understanding the pace is really important. So the 
um, Hillary for America campaign in 2016 was basically a functioning startup for 577 days. So it like comes to life very quickly and lives for a very specific amount of time and then um, is sort of ramped down. So the teams, especially the leadership teams, including myself, we worked nonstop for 19 months straight. And those 19 months really fly by, right? Time's not on your side. And to put up with this accelerated presidential race, uh, the team and I, we worked a lot. So there was a lot of seven-day work weeks. In fact, we counted them up, and there were 27 straight seven-day work weeks in the 2015-2016 cycle. And that's because we had to handle a lot of reactive and proactive events. We went through 13 debates. We went through 58 elections. So this includes the primary all the way leading up uh, to the general. And during all of this, the tech team built and launched 55 apps in 579 days. So this roughly translates to one new app or service launched to production every 10.5 days for 19 months straight. And so that's an incredible amount of velocity. Even at the most you know, high growth rocket ship startup, that kind of velocity is really hard to achieve. And so as we talk about lessons to revitalize teams and to revitalize ourselves as leaders, the campaign experience that achieved that kind of velocity um, is where that was only doable because we were able to let go. So what were those 55 apps? Here's actually the list of things that we kind of built. Things to help organize volunteers, to help educate the public about voting, that whole get out the vote type of campaign, fundraising, engaging new voters, persuadable voters, so on and so forth. This is what we built. Here's actually a better slide. It's, it has some of the screenshots of what we built. And in building this volume of products, we learned a thing or two about how to build fast and how to build focused. But we also had to learn um, how important it was and to be willing to let go. Because though we built a lot of technology in a short amount of time, there were plenty of ideas that we just couldn't bring to life for whatever reason. Uh, to say yes to that meant saying no to something else that was more important. So it was like a resourcing issue. Or maybe it never floated above the line and the ever prioritizing roadmap um, landscape that we were in. So by willing to let go, what I'm saying is that we didn't get fixated or debate on ideas that just didn't have the time or the interest to come to fruition. So as leaders, we emulated that be willing to let go mantra, and our teams would often follow by example. So this was necessary in the environment that we were in on the campaign, and regardless of what type of environment you're in, you know, whether it's a time-sensitive project for a client or another you know, driven product organization, ensuring your teams recognize that not all ideas will be able to be given the energy and the commitment to focus on it, prioritize it, and deliver it is a good thing, to embrace that and to be honest about it. It resets expectations where if as a leadership team we're willing to let go and maybe even incur the, the pain of some good ideas that could actually bear good fruit not coming to life, uh, the teams themselves will start modeling that behavior and that just is, allows a much more resilient organization to come forth. So the reality check is that real world collaboration and development is important to embrace and own instead of shying away from uh, the reality of things and living in sort of an idealized environment. So that's kind of the tip that I was trying to, to get across there. We were able to sort of embrace that, okay, that's a cool idea, that could actually like move the needle, but we can't do it. We were open and honest about it, explained the reasonings back to the team, and just had to move on. Okay, next insight, this again comes a little bit from the campaign, is the power of problem-focused teams. So again, this is something that I think is very valuable regardless of the type of organization that you're working in. Um, I'm sure many of us have worked in environments where things are really siloed. And that is just a common thing that happens at even the healthiest organizations. It's just really easy to get into a place where you're sort of siloed. And it takes a lot of effort of, of intentional, thoughtful, proactive work to break those silos. And when you do that, when you have problem-focused, cross-functional teams, that is really where the magic can happen. That is not only where great execution happens, it's also where great growth happens, especially for um, your middle layer of, of leadership and, and those newer to the organization. You're empowering them to own a particular area. They get to really um, exercise their creative side of their brains. That is a good thing that helps against attrition, that helps into buy-in and commitment into the organization. So that's what I mean, cross-functional problem-focused teams. So, 
the tech team uh, on the campaign, uh, you know, we built all those applications. We were actually initially organized into sort of a front end and a back end team. And that very quickly became a non-ideal way of working. And so as the primaries got closer, um, as the, the campaign efforts really took off, we organized into problem-focused cross-functional teams. We actually called them squads. And this was one of the best moves that we ever did on the campaign because ideation, creativity, ownership, and streamlined execution came out of those problem-focused uh, squads in a much better way. It was a real ga game changer. So here's actually how we were organized on the campaign. Um, it's kind of a busy slide, but basically what I'm trying to call out is that in each row we had product management, design, um, engineering sort of living, and the vertical lines are sort of the squads that they lived in. And so these squads often change composition. This is actually a snapshot of how we ended the campaign, but you can see that groups of people were empowered to focus on a particular problem area. So here we have the group, the vertical group, again, cross-functional team, engineers, product managers, designers, researchers, um, focused in a vertical sort of problem-focused area to focus on voters and volunteers. How do we uh, uh, attract and convert volunteers leading up to election day um, and all of the work around our get out the vote efforts? Or, you know, I led um, our storytelling team at the tail end of the campaign, which was when really we were heightening up how do we tell the difference um, and highlight the differences between the candidates. This was a cross-functional problem-focused team with that problem space really, really um, defined. And so by having these, these teams that broke out of their functional teams, yes, we were all members of our product management team, our design team, our policy team, our communications team, our engineering team, by have, recognizing that those functional teams existed, but pulling together higher level structures to bring us together in these focused problem areas, well-defined problem statements for these individual verticals, um, what success would look like as we chipped away at those problems. By, by really defining that, we empowered a much smaller group of people to make further progress on a, on a big, hairy, shared problem. And so that is one of the tips I wanted to kind of get into our brains. And let's switch gears a bit and talk a little bit about how to do that, we need to really be mindful about how we communicate. Um, whether it's how you are communicating within your team, across your teams, at your organization writ large, how you all communicate can have a real impact on how healthy and focused and um, disciplined that the team sort of feels. So, this is a little bit of a blunt statement. Poor communication will dilute impact, frustrate employees, and result in failure. Um, but I sincerely believe it. I have experienced it many times in my career and have internalized it in a way to sort of be like, okay, how can we avoid that in the future? The act of leading is primarily centered around communication. Whether you're communicating your vision, your strategy, your plans, your intentions, communicating good news, bad news, really everything. It's all about communication. Sure, it might be in the written form, it might be verbally, it might be through a presentation, but leadership is communication. And teams that practice uh, mindful communication, especially leaders that practice sort of mindful, thoughtful communication, have higher impact, higher morale, and better collaboration. So by rolling out mindful communication processes in your own organization, you can really create magic. And you know, I, th I think at the beginning of, the car of this talk, I sort of um, commented on how some of the situations I was walking into as a new product leader was to almost undo um, what had been you know, months, if not years, of sort of poor execution, attrition, bad leadership decisions, so on and so, so forth. And all of that kind of adds up to be almost this like weight that lives on the team and stifles any innovation, inspiration, creativity, whimsy, so on and so forth. And I tried many different tactics in the beginning to break into it, you know, accelerated hiring, completely re-changing um, the product strategy and the product roadmap, so on and so forth. And we made some inroads, but the things that really moved the organization from a place of yeesh to, hey, we're pointed in the right direction. Uh, things are happening, morale is better, uh, ideas are flowing up and down and throughout the entire team was mindful communication. So 
let's identify some explicit steps that can be useful to take back into our own organizations. And something that I do want to call out is when I would talk about mindful communication, sometimes people almost interpret that as, oh, I'm not being mindful in my communication. Like, like it's not a judgment thing. It is an ever-growing practice. Like, I don't think I have ever won at mindful communication or I'm ever complete at thinking about this. It's just something to keep in mind as we lead teams of varying and diverse backgrounds, you know? Um, I have been, you know, working in this, in the tech field now for 15 plus years and there's a big difference from sort of how I was when I started my career to where I am now. And um, mindful communication has allowed me to sort of communicate with my teams and my organization in a way where it doesn't even matter how much we have a shared background. Um, it just means that we're always speaking in a way where we're truly hearing each other and able to listen and navigate through all the difficult things that happen as organizations have to evolve and change in what a fast paced environment we're in. So let's talk through some steps about how to make this a reality. So first is really being mindful of your audience. So consider who is in the room, how they might receive the information that you're sharing as a leader. What's at stake for them? Thinking about that before you walk into any meeting is a game changer. One-on-one, -on -one, team meeting, you know, whole entire organization, client pitch, whatever, really be mindful of your audience. You know, maybe someone in the room is feeling like the conversations that are about to happen in that conversation is really high stakes, or the conversation is about a topic that is very important to them. If you think about who the audience is and what they're expecting to get out of it, or the frame mindset that they might be in in that conversation, you're a little more cognizant about how to deliver that conversation mindfully. So it really means, you know, when I say be mindful of your audience, it means understanding how each person might be hearing and digesting what's happening or what's about to happen. Another simple tactic, um, but one worth mentioning, is to really be aware of your medium. You know, um, I don't just mean things like tone of voice or something, but choice of wording, body language, things like that. You may not realize that being efficient with your words could come across to someone else as being um, frustrated or short-tempered. I cross my arms a lot, and that can often get interpreted as defensive. So if you're communicating over text, uh, remember that it's a lossy medium. So tone and emotion is really hard to convey on text, so things might get overlooked or misunderstood. So again, I'm not saying how to fix that. I'm just saying it's an awareness to bring into our conversations to help us be more mindful, to be aware of the medium that we're in. So really think about proactive ways to seek out how to be inclusive with your wording so that everyone in the room is acknowledged and not just the majority. Another thing that is really important, especially as we grow um, in leadership positions and run bigger and bigger meetings, you know, this is something I think about before I get in front of a board for a board meeting or run, um, you know, a simple stand-up with my um, team for a particular sprint, is to consider the room's power dynamics. So you want to consider the power dynamics of the group that you're communicating with. Um, this can be really pervasive and exist even if we wish that they didn't. So someone in the room might have the ability to fire someone, or maybe you're a stakeholder with a lot of power and you don't realize how influential your words can be. These are good power dynamics to keep in front of um, and just to recognize as you're having those conversations. And when you're making an ask of someone, first ask yourself, is this person in a position to take the action I am suggesting? Are we coming from different places? And if so, how might you acknowledge that discrepancy? Because they might be really frustrated or confused if you're venting or unloading on them, um, and they're not really in a place to do anything about that. So think about whether this person is in a position to take the action that you're suggesting. Another explicit tip is to really elevate the conversation. So this is one of the hardest things to remember to do when we're in that amygdala hijack situation that we talked about earlier. But if you can elevate the conversation, you know, keep it constructive, keep it productive, aim to make something better to get shared results that can really help. Um, instead of trying to tear something down, aim to make it better. Um, that can really help um, in making the message sort of land better. So one way to elevate the conversation is to meet transparency with responsibility. Um, I hate anonymous feedback. I've seen a lot of poorly constructed feedback shared in anonymous format, and that doesn't really help anyone do a better job. So there's really a fine line between anonymous and trolling. Um, and so really what I ask my leaders to do, what I try to do is before I click send on that email or have that 
um, you know, jot off that memo or whatnot, imagining being face to face with this person and having that conversation in real life. It can, it can really help me make sure that what I'm trying to share is, is thoughtful and mindful. So, you know, honesty is not constructive if it's cruel. And I think that's just an important thing to remember. Um, another thing is that we want to expect that everyone comes to work to do the best job that they can and make the best decisions possible given their capabilities and oftentimes the information that's available to them. So we're all playing for the same team. We want to help our organization win. And to do that, it's really important to assume best intentions. A lot of the work of assuming best intentions results on a solid foundation of empathy, which as humans, we have unreserved limits of. So, you know, ask yourself, what is going on for this person? Um, remember that how they're interacting with you in real life, you know, whether it's a peer on your team or one of your direct reports, uh, it might just be the tip of the iceberg for them. There might be a lot going on, you know, behind the scenes that you're not aware of. So practicing empathy can, can really help bring that um, into the forefront. And you want to encourage your teams to listen to learn, to really stay genuinely curious. This is often one of the hardest ones to do. Your goal really is to build an understanding about someone's behavior, not to make judgments or accusations. And so what I ask my leaders to do often, and this has really helped kind of revitalize our teams, is to recognize that others have experience, expertise and context that they do not. So this allows all of us to collaborate and listen to each other better. It really helps to be prepared to be surprised when you walk into a room. I know I, you know, my day is full of meetings. I have like five minutes to eat my lunch. I'm definitely walking into a room thinking, okay, I need to walk out with this decision. I have presupposed the decision. I have presupposed the solution that I want. I'm walking in with that as a bullseye. That is a recipe for disaster, right? That is just how I bulldoze over my team, frustrate them, limit ideation and creativity. Uh, I get the result that I want, but at what collateral damage? So being prepared to be surprised is really important. Walking into the room, I'll be open, being like, I would like us to walk out with this sort of, um, with a, an agreement on X, Y, Z, but then allow the conversation to sort of move forward, being open to multiple perspectives, underlying factors, opinions and ideas that um, we're not, uh, I don't have or may not be privy to me. It's the best way to have a conducive conversation. So a couple of those tips that we just talked about, helpful whether you are trying to get a leadership team onto the same page, whether you're trying to instill more thoughtful communications within the teams that you're leaving, leading, so on and so forth. I have brought this to a board meeting before, so everyone can take advantage of these tips. Okay, last insight, and then we'll have a few minutes for questions, is the power of joining forces. So I'm assuming many in this room are not um, or have peer leaders, right? Maybe there are some CEOs here, but even CEOs have leadership that they have to coordinate and um, they're not, no one's just fully in the driver's seat, right? So cross-functional leadership success means joining forces with our peer leaders. That, that results in cross-functional organizational success. So the reality is disjointed things happen when teams are siloed. You have disjointed decisions, disjointed strategies, disjointed efforts. Um, if leadership sort of joined together and coordinated better, that disjointedness, the potential for that disjointedness really goes down. So you'll start seeing higher levels of trust, coordination, synchronicity across your teams. And this is really a healthy dynamic to have. You'll definitely see uh, the fruits of that labor within your organization. So some tactical ways I have joined together with co-leaders of mine um, for the teams that we sort of co-lead are the following. So one, I'm a huge advocate of cross-organizational meetings. I mean, it's important to have team meetings for the teams that you organize, but partner up with other departments within the organization and lead some cross-organizational meetings. These can be strategic updates, broad check-ins, major announcements, you know, whatever sort of comes to mind. So for example, at Kickstarter, I led product and design. My good friend, um, Laura Hogan, ran engineering, and so we regularly brought our teams together, product design, engineering, um, together to share important news. So by everyone being in the same space together or virtual space like a Google Hangout, it really fosters a sense of collaboration and in it togetherness. It fights against that siloization that kills creativity, kills collaboration, kills you know, productive conversations. 
So to strengthen these cross-organizational meetings, Laura and I would do things like public Q&As, open shared office hours, where we would field questions from the entire product organization. Um, additionally, I did this at Kickstarter, I do this at the ACLU, my peer leaders and I will jointly author meeting agendas. When folks saw that we were partnering together on these meetings, the expectation was almost implicitly planted in their brains that they start partnering together um, at their own levels, across within their teams and across their teams. So we basically aim to be the behavior that we wanted to see emulated across the organization. Another very simple but very powerful tip is to write cross-organizational emails together with your peer leaders. Um, I do this at the ACLU a lot. I regularly author emails co-authored with my chief analytics officer or my chief development officer. These jointly authored emails are actually signed by the both of us and go to our full teams. And so the entire organization sees us partnering together. Um, and so that really then implies that, hey, we are doing the work to get on the same page and be aligned. And so we expect that of you. And the wonderful halo effect that I started seeing was when we started co-authoring emails together. Again, they could be strategy updates, they could be execution updates, whatever they were. Um, it really started building more confidence. It fostered a lot more confidence in our plans from the people who are receiving those emails. I think they started seeing like, okay, great, a lot of work went into this uh, by two different department heads with busy schedules. There's some value, some merit here. So because my teams saw the layer of leadership above them coordinating, they saw us holding each other accountable, I saw that halo effect within my own teams, my direct reports, where they started operating that way. And that really resulted in stronger collaboration and better communication across all the functional teams that lived in my world and lived in my peer, peer leaders' worlds as well. So the level of honesty and candid conversation that I had with my teams and with my peer leadership group resulted in the beginnings of healthier collaboration on all of our teams. And so people started avoiding sticky subjects less, they started revisiting assumptions, they started discussing things that had honestly in some organizations been unchanged for years. And this all really bred trust and accountability. Okay, so we just zoomed through seven insights um, that I think can really revitalize, align, and focus cross-functional teams. Again, many of the examples I shared are from product development organizations or totally niche world of presidential elections. Um, but I hope that you can see that some of these tips, I mean, I would argue all of these tips can be applied into any organization um, and can be applied at any level of a particular team. You don't have to be you know, a C-suite leader to take advantage of some of this stuff. In fact, you shouldn't. These are healthy habits and muscle memory to be building at, at any time within your career, at any layer of an organization. So I hope some of these tactics you can take back to your teams uh, this week and start putting them to work to revitalize, align, coordinate, and focus at a much higher level. Um, and so with that, I think we have about 10 minutes for some questions or comments or ideas to share. You can just shout it out and I'll repeat it back to the group to answer any questions. Just raise your hand if you have any questions. Yes, you with the pen. Yes. Okay, that's a great question. So the question was, what tips do I have for fully distributed teams uh, to avoid having a million meetings? Um, so the first thing that comes to mind is that living documents and product processes. Um, I think we, because we are in meetings nonstop, which takes away time for real work, um, we don't have the time to sit down and document things. Which I, so it's like crazy, it's like chicken and egg, right? Like by not doing that, we then warrant more meetings to share more of stuff that can actually be just read in a nicely written email or quick one pager or whatnot. So I encourage a lot of that, um, where it's like, why does this meeting need to happen? I'm gonna actually nix it. Let's just try to figure this out, maybe through coordinating something on the wiki or whatnot, and then we'll meet if we really have to. Some very simple things that come to mind, I mean, I am like really mean about meetings in my calendar in general. Um, pushing back, I, I won't accept any meeting without an agenda. I basically default answer to any 
response to any meeting that is more than 30 minutes is, why do we need to meet more than 30 minutes? I think this conversation can happen in 15, so on and so forth. Standardize a lot of things, so bring to sprint stand-up XYZ, or bring to the team meeting on Friday XYZ, or bring to the monthly roadmap review XYZ to then avoid ad hoc meetings, and embed that ethos in all of the leaders within your organization. 90% of meetings are scheduled by like a tiny number of people at the organization. Those are the culprits that you need to focus in on and be like, hey, is this worth our time? Um, Kickstarter, this was endemic at Kickstarter, so after every meeting I asked everyone to just do a quick vote, like was this helpful or not helpful? And if a meeting, even one time, was a majority not helpful, we killed it. You can always bring it back, but err on the side of just like nixing meetings. So if this is already happening at your organization, there's, um, you know, bad habits or a precedent that you have to turn, right? You have to turn a culture change of being less meeting um, focused. So if you're in a position to do that, just start canceling meetings, questioning meetings, shortening meetings. If you're not in a position to do that, lobby your leadership to do that and start seeing if that's better. Also, there's this great um, uh, article, I'll, tr I'll tweet it out, that actually listed out like 20 different tactics to um, lobby your leadership or like get your leadership, because sometimes they're the ones who can like spread this sort of meeting heavy culture to get them to change it. I, ca I can't remember exactly who wrote it, but I'll tweet it out after the session. Yes. I'm really curious if you have any advice on, you know, if you're working cross-functionally, you're shipping a product, you're doing all the things that you've talked about, and then you have like a member of like the C-suite or a couple members of the C-suite step in and kind of throw a wrench in. The swooper, yes. Yeah, what do you do about that? Okay, so the question is, what do you do if you have a C-suite executive or a higher level leader who comes in and swoops in and throws a wrench into best laid plans. Okay, great. Again, that happens very common at organizations. It tends to be one or two people in the organization who does that. The crazy thing is everyone recognizes that this person is capable of doing that and then we all start uh, expecting it, allowing it, and almost catering to it in a weird way um, that then ensures that it continues to happen. And so that's a really hard thing to do, um, or to, uh, a really hard behavior to change. So a couple things I found that have worked is, one, uh, there are that person's a swooper, there's the defenders. So the defenders have the ability, the, the standing within the organization, um, the social equity and trust to prevent that swooping from happening. Those are the people who have to explain why this is harmful for the organization why this is something that needs to stop and how to stop it. Usually someone comes swooping in because they feel out of the loop, they feel like their idea wasn't heard, they have a presupposed uh, notion of what should be built and why, and then when they see the thing almost you know, out, out the door and they're like, I thought it was this, no one brought them along on the journey to justify and explain why things might be different. And so then they feel like their only reaction is to use their title or to use their power in the organization to like swoop in and, and change things. So you have to get their peer leaders to almost like an intervention, help them understand not only that they're doing it, because sometimes they don't even know that they're doing it, but the cost of that. What is the outcome of that? And be very specific. I advise a lot of startups and I had to walk a team through some really difficult conversations where it was like, you are a reason why there is attrition. You are a reason why no one feels like we ship anything. You are a reason why things ship three times later than it should be from our original costing. So help them understand not only that they do it, but what the collateral damage is of them doing it. And then, the, then all of that is useless if you then don't then make clear how they can slot into the conversation to avoid the things that caused them to swoop in the beginning. Cast a wide net during that discovery phase. Bring them in early to hear their conversation, to hear their opinion so they feel part of the conversation. Check in with them more frequently. Again, that should not be the rank and file members of your team. That is not their job. No one wants to stand up to the CEO and be like, that's a bad idea. That, that is what your leadership team is being paid the big bucks to do, so they have to have those conversations. As a rank and file person, you can say, hey, my boss person, in your one-on-one -on -one with X, did you walk through the latest mock-ups of this feature? Did you give them an update on why this thing is gonna be late? Um, make sure that the, the flow of communication within the organization is set up for that, but don't throw that poor person to have that conversation in. Does that help? Yeah. Great. You in the back. Yeah, you. Uh, how often do you have to bring the department together to discuss Okay, 
How often do I have those big cross-departmental meetings to prevent the soloing? Not that often. I aim for quarterly. Um, at the ACLU, you know, everything that's happening, it's like 60 minutes of a meeting is like gold. So I'm not just going to throw those on people's calendars willy-nilly. Um, but I think some regular frequency of that builds the muscle memory, the expectation that we are meeting cross-departmentally. Um, and that is separate from all staff meetings, right? So the ACLU, we have all staff meetings once every six months. But the, t the I run product and digital, the peer teams that we work the closest with, I try to bring us together about once a quarter. So that's arbitrary. I would say aim for a cadence where, one, the meeting agenda and topics feel meaty. If you're kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel, I mean, this goes for any meeting, on agenda, revisit um, the point of the meeting and the frequency of the meeting. It should feel like, it should feel almost like, oh, we definitely have to have the meeting because the agenda actually looks like it could definitely take more than an hour, right? So you want to have a frequency where the substance of the conversation is meaty and applicable to everyone. Use different mediums for ad hoc updates if, like the, you, know, if you need to share sort of breaking news stuff. Um, and, and not too frequent that people are bored or you know, not, not paying attention. I feel like I'm ignoring the side of the room. Any questions? Yes. Oh, no. Uh, recommendations for project tracking software. I have learned, I don't know, maybe this is like too blunt to state. I um, avoid taking a stance on any uh, specific tool. I just, because it's like religious warfare. So I just basically say, hey, this project needs project management software. You, team people who live in it day to day, come back and tell me what we're using. Instead of being like, I love Asana, and trying to like shoehorn that in, it's like, uh, we need this. I don't care what tool you're using. I don't, I'm not dogmatic about the tool. Just come back and tell me what you're using, and we're all then going to commit to using it thoroughly. So I don't have a favorite, really, of any type of tool, but I believe in the power of specifying why a tool is needed, what the purpose of that tool is, and then mandating hardcore that everyone use it. Because then the whole point of doing it is failed if you know, you have people not using the tool. So I let my, as, as someone in a leadership position, I let my teams decide. They enjoy that, they feel bought in and empowered, they always come back with something better than what I would have suggested anyways. So I defer and I just say, next time we meet, tell me what we're using. Yeah. Oh yes. Okay, so that happens at the ACLU. So we, the, like prior to this sort of era and, and, and my world, they actually did a lot of their work through many different vendors. So, you know, um, we just relaunched our website. Check it out, aclu.org. But um, every prior website had been done by a cadre of vendors who, I mean, talk about left hand not talking to the right hand. So it's kind of why I demanded we're gonna redo our website from, from, um, from the inside. Um, many of these, tips apply. You just have to force everyone to change what their concept of the organization is to think more broadly. The organization can actually be a broader umbrella of you know, connected vendors, freelancers, contractors, and then the core organization that might be paying everyone else's bill. But that larger group is actually what the team is. And so a couple things I've done at the ACLU was when I do those cross-departmental meetings or those um, team updates, uh, definitely including all of our vendors and freelancers on it, co-authoring things with the head of you know, the agency that's helping work on this project, this or that. H have them almost look, feel, and act like extensions of the, of the team. Now, if you are the vendor or the freelancer working in, that can be a hard thing to do, but use whatever leverage you have or maybe a great relationship with someone to sort of be like, hey, can we try this out? And if it's working, if there's, you're feeling more buy-in and commitment from within the core organization and within your world, that's like proof that this is working. So you can try to get, let it uh, catch fire. Um, okay, I think we're at time. I'm just gonna hang out, answer any questions. I hope this was helpful. Good luck, work is hard, but we should enjoy it. Thank you. <laughs>